Good day, fellow learners. This is your mentor, your fact check buddy, Ray Gapus, once again joining you for our next generation NCLEX Hour and Pointers. This time around, we're going to talk about our pointers set number 35. And without further ado, let's begin. Now, the first question that we have to ask ourselves when we're preparing for the next generation NCLEX would be how do I study? to pass the test. Now remember that the test is very dynamic. It's constantly changing. You cannot predict what's going to come out if you just study on your own. You have to have a mentor who will help you navigate through the different concepts and filter those things that would just waste your time. So the most important thing that you have to remember is first have a mentor who will help you out, choose what you need to focus on in terms of the concepts that you need to master for the test, okay? So the key is get an expert opinion. And I'm not saying I'm the only expert, but I've been in this industry for 30 years now. We have started in 1994. And we have celebrated our 30th year last year. And as a mentor, this is my 31st year. So I believe so. There's no mentor in the Philippines or in the world that could have monitored the progression of the NCLEX RN the way I did it. So NCLEX is like oxygen to me. Without it, I wouldn't be here. So let's move on. The first concept that I'd like to highlight for this set of pointers would be pediculosis. Now, remember, pediculosis requires contact and standard precautions. Why? Because the primary mode of transmission of your pediculosis would be prolonged head-to-head -head contact. Now, there's very little or small chance that this can spread by sharing of hats and other hair articles like ribbons, clips, but they can still potentially spread it out. Now, re also remember that you cannot get this by swimming in a pool because your nits or your lice cannot survive underwater for several hours. But um, there's one question that you could be asking like can chlorine or chlorinated water potentially kill the nits or the lights mm, no it doesn't kill it so therefore it's not an appropriate thing to tell a client with pediculosis to wash the hair with chlorinated water it doesn't have an effect at all so Instructions when you are providing health teachings to parents should center on the fact that pediculosis or infestation with lice is common among school-age children because they have a tendency to share hair articles. And whenever they get prolonged head-to-head -head contact, especially if they're seated together for a long period of time, watching TV with friends, then they get this. Now, our those that infest the hair of the preschool child, which we call the lies, carry specific bacteria or virus, or does it cause diseases? No, it doesn't. So it does not carry a disease at all. So, what is the main problem? Well, the main problem is when school-age children get infested with lice, their hair becomes itchy, specifically at the back of the head and behind the ears, where the lice would usually cluster themselves. Okay, therefore, it's very important that we provide health instructions on the prevention of pediculosis. And the way to start it is to help parents identify that the condition exists 
among school age children. So the first is how? Well, we have to tell them about the physical characteristics of the nets as well as the lice. So lice could be pale and gray in color. They're about the size of a sesame seed and they produce their eggs and their eggs are usually oval shaped, either whitish or yellowish in color. And the lice eggs cling to the hair shafts. So that would differentiate them from, say, for example, dandruff. Because the dandruff would usually fall off the hair and your nits would firmly attach themselves to the hair. So that's the difference between your dandruffs and your nits. Now, another key thing that you have to tell parents to be aware of is that um, your lice would primarily be transferred from one kid to the other because it crawls. The lice won't jump, it doesn't fly, so it simply crawls. So therefore, the longer that these kids are physically having contact with each other, the higher the risk that they can have the disease. Now, how can parents potentially check if their children are having infestation with lice? Is it appropriate thing to use light as they try to look for the lice in the nits by um, looking at the hair shafts? Well, we have to remember the fact that your lice would usually avoid light and they move quickly. So therefore, it is best to just check on the hair shafts with the naked eye, not necessarily using artificial light. Okay, and then you can actually implement the comb out method. Let's say the comb out method. Well, we use a um, very very um, fine tooth comb. Okay, but first we tell the child to wash their hair and then use the fine tooth comb all over. Okay, the area, and then after that, wipe the comb on wet paper and then examine if there are lice and nets okay, that were taken um, with, with the process. And then you have to repeatedly do this, okay? So what's important, therefore, in terms of this shared instruction for clients with pediculosis is all household contacts should be checked and cured of the condition, and uh, treatment would involve um, the use of pediculocide, like, for example, uh, ivermectin lotion, which would just require a one-time application. Okay, uh, you have to leave it in place for ten minutes, and then after that, okay, you can wash it with water, but don't apply shampoo for one to two days thereafter. Or they can use your malathion or permethrin lotion. Now, for these two, um, you need to apply it twice, at least a week interval, because they this. Um, lotions are neurotoxic, so there has to be a weak interval in between the application. The first application would be um, the first time that you found out that the patient had pediculosis, and the second time would be a week after. Now, there's one safety precaution, though, that you have to remember for your malathion. It's flammable, so it's very, very important to mention that to parents. Okay, so... Well, before we proceed any further, first and foremost, I'd like to say congratulations to one of our pastors from Bicol University who passed the Texas Board of Nursing last November, 20, November 10, 2023. So congratulations. And here's what Ms. Laura Bolseco, USRN, has to share with us. So as a Gapos baby since my CGFNS days way back in 2008, passed the exam too, but the severe retrogression halted my plans. Early this year, I signed up with an agency and I was elated when they told me that Ray A. Gapus Review System will be coaching us. So Ray is a genius and his trilogy of books are amazingly concise and organized. I utilize the Ray A. Gapus Review System course shell. That's one of the most important components of one's recipe to pass the NGN, the Ray Gapus System course shell, which are um, being updated on a monthly basis. It's it's unlike the apps that you have 
on the commercial market. So she attended two comprehensive review. You can do that. You can even attend 10 if you want, because with no additional cost, we're giving it to you unlimited. And we have updated concepts and slides every month and two quick fix sessions. Once again, that's unlimited. I also had other international QBanks for CATs and I cross reference everything to his books. Thank you, Gapos family. Dios Mabalos, once again, that's Lurbol Seco, U-S-R-N. Okay, now, the next thing that I'd like to talk about is the ethical concept of fidelity. Now, in simple terms, it simply means keeping our promises. So in other words, when we keep our word, when we keep our promises to our patients, like if we tell our patients that we're going to come back in 30 minutes, and then we came back after 30 minutes, that is fidelity. Now, if, what if, if, if you got tied up and you're unable to attend to the patient, come back after three minutes? Well, the most um, acceptable thing to do is to delegate somebody else to see the patient and mention to the patient that you got tied up with other tasks that need your attention. That is still fidelity because you're following your patient's expectations. Okay, we also would like to congratulate, well, we have a lot of passers worldwide from more than 30 countries around the world. So we have a 60 year old who passed at the age of, okay, who, who passed the test at the age of 60. That's Jane Geneo Serrano, okay? And we also have, well, one from St. Louis University, all these people who are passing the test through our system. So I believe, the next layout will be for you. So stick around. And of course, let's move on to the concept of advanced directive. Well, this is also known as your living will, okay? So it's a legal document that communicates a patient's wishes about healthcare decisions in the event that the patient becomes incapacitated. The keyword there is incapacitated. What does that mean? Well, the patient may no longer be able to make sound decision, just like in the case of a patient with hepatic encephalopathy, once the ammonia has already accumulated and has greatly affected the brain of the patient, so the level of consciousness deteriorates. And so that's when the provisions of the advanced directive would take effect. Ma, now, the question that you have to ask is, what if there's no advanced directive? Well, in the absence of an advanced directive, well, you can use a court-appointed surrogate or even a self-appointed surrogate who can decide on the client's behalf. However, okay, this appointed surrogate should um, have the durable power of attorney for healthcare, which simply means that they are given the authority to make the decision in the event that the patient is unable to do so because of advancement of their pathological conditions. Now, how do we ensure that the physicians or the doctors or everyone involved in the care of the client is aware that the client is an advanced directive. Ideally, the advanced directive should be a copy of it, should be given to every doctor attending to the patient and should be attached to the permanent medical records of the patient. Okay? You can attach the advanced directive or the healthcare power of attorney. Now, what about if the patient utilize an app to create the advanced directive? Well, that is acceptable. So that doesn't mean that it is of lesser significance than one that is written by the client himself or something that's holographic in nature. Okay, so the second question that we need to ask ourselves is, what are the things beyond reviewing concepts that we need to be familiar with in order to pass next generation endpoints? Well, 
an important aspect of taking the test is learning how to navigate technology. And studying with technology is a process. It's not a one-time thing. It's not as if you took a sample test and you learned how to navigate it and that's it. No. Preparing for the test is a process. And utilizing the appropriate tools is the one of the most important decisions that you have to make. So let me share with you what Ali Jane has shared. Here's an English translation. It's a comprehensive review that is the best, sir. It's true. If you know the concept, even if the concepts are reversed and whatever question they ask, you will get the answer. So the comprehensive review is being offered at the Ray Gap system on a monthly basis. We do it live, okay? We do it live. You can interact with us, your mentors. We don't do a videotape, okay? You can only request for a videotape version if you miss the class for some pressing concerns and that could be given to you immediately thereafter okay this is um the uh, dashboard that shows you the interface of our course shells you have all the subjects from safety and infection control basic care and comfort health promotion and maintenance management of care physiological adaptation one two three reduction of risk potential and psychosocial integrity you name it we have it, and we have our own version of QBank and practice tests, both standalone, multiple choice questions, and the next gen questions. And the most important question of all that you need to ask yourself is what kind of environment should I be in when I'm preparing for the NGN? You have to be in a conducive environment that will help you focus. And here at the Ray Gapo system, we keep our classes in a very, very convenient environment. We're the only one with an NGN simulation room that you don't see anywhere. So this is our NGN simulation room. That's the topmost picture. And the bottom picture is an example of the class we're conducting face-to-face. -face. If you want a full face-to-face -face class, please do join me in our bootcamp. And my, may I invite you if you want to join the most flexible test prep class for the NCLEX RN, your choice of live face-to-face, -face, live virtual class, and on-demand unlimited video recorded lessons. Our fee starts at 3,499, including QBanks and tree books, plus engine strategies and sample questions by me. So this is actually our quick fix session. The next one would come in on a monthly basis. So keep watch of our schedules. So thank you so much. Once again, this is your mentor, your fact check buddy, Ray Gapus, joining you for session number 35. See ya.